You're listening to Barbell Logic, brought to you by Barbell Logic Online Coaching, where each week we take a systematic walk through strength training and the refining power of voluntary hardship. Welcome to the Barbell Logic Podcast. I'm Scott Hambrick. That's Matt Reynolds. And today we're going to talk about the equipment that you need to bring to the gym or have at the gym in order to do the four big barbell lifts where you get strong like bull. We are the anti-gym. You should have your own gym. Poor gym. Not gym. Not J-I-M from the office. You can't say that. This is a... Oh, I don't know. <laughs> no, we don't want you going to a gym. I'm going to shoot you straight. Well, why not? Because gyms are full of ridiculousness and everybody knows it. Like my mom knows it and my grandpa knows it. And they don't know anything about this stuff, but they know that gyms are full of crap. Right? They know that what is going on at gyms full of purple treadmills is not what changes your life for the better. And so some people don't have an option, right? Some of you live in cities and you live in an apartment and you don't have an extra bedroom or a garage or a basement to have your own gym. But if you do have the opportunity to have your own gym, the number of excellent equipment manufacturers now in the United States that has really just exploded over the last five to 10 years has made it so that it's very economical to purchase your own home gym equipment and then train at your home and make it part of your lifestyle at your home. If I want to watch a movie with my family, 99% of the time, I watch a movie at my house. I don't have to go somewhere else to watch the movie, right? Or we cook dinner at home. Like we occasionally eat out. But I enjoy cooking dinner at home and I enjoy training with my family at home. The problem with gyms are manifold. Like you go there and you do the things right. Like we low bar squat, we do the press, the bench press, the deadlift. We do them the way we do and we do them for a specific reason. It's not because bro taught us that or whatever. It's we do it for the reasons we do them. Yep. And you're going to get a lot particularly the ladies, unfortunately, are going to get a lot of unwanted, silly feedback that's a nuisance. They put us in a position to be less than courteous sometimes yep. to refuse their help. So that's a big problem. And uh, yep. training at home gets you out of that. Yeah, equipment quality is awful. So they have terrible equipment quality. For us, the foundation, we'll talk about this here in a minute, but the foundation of our everything we do is the barbell. And boy, is it rare to go to a gym, especially a big box gym, and find barbells that are worth more than about $25. They're just junk. Yeah, not a lot of good barbells. We'll talk about what a good barbell is and what a bad barbell is. Most often, they don't have enough squat racks. Right. They're just not set up for somebody to be there for an hour and a half and to train hard. Yep. And then also the commute time, you know, that's time that we'd be better off spending with our families. And so we want to get rid of that. And then later on, as you get stronger and stronger and stronger, you're probably going to need to go to a four-day split and train four days a week. And that's so much easier to do if you're doing that in your spare room or your basement or your garage and not having to go to the gym. But if you are looking for a gym or creating your home gym, you've got to have some equipment. Yep. And of course, the most basic is a good barbell and plates that weigh something. That's right. So we really start with a good barbell. And barbells have been standardized over the years. Almost all good barbells are either 20 kilograms, which is 44 pounds, or they're 45 pounds. Yep. Right? So they're somewhere in there. Most of the barbells I have are pound. I use pounds because I live in the United States. I use freedom units. And so I've got 45 pound barbells. And then I also have pound plates as opposed to kilogram plates, but it's really okay to have either. So when I look for a barbell, what am I looking for? Like what distinguishes, and let's start with the most basic thing for people who have no idea. I have a telltale thing that I'll do for somebody that's like, hey, I'm going to X fitness gym, right? Planet Fitness, Anytime Fitness, 24-Hour Fitness, name your fitness gym. How do I know if a barbell is decent at that gym? What's the first thing you would look at? The first thing I would look at is I would look at the end of the sleeve and Me see too. if it had a hex nut in there. If it's got a hex bolt, it's Allen bolt, it's not a good one. That's exactly right. So you look at the very end of the barbell, the very end of the sleeve, and if it's got a hex nut on the end, it's junk. Now, if it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily mean it's good, but it at least passed the hex nut test. But what you'll find is that the vast majority of them have hex nuts in them. And so that means that they are not a bushing barbell or a bearing barbell, right? So good barbells 
have sleeves that spin, sleeves that rotate. Is rotate the right word? Spin, spin, rotate, rotate, spin. turn about an axis. Yeah. Are there easy ways to tell that a bar is a bushing bar? So typically a bushing bar is going to be a pretty solid bar. And those bars are going to run somewhere in the ballpark of $300 for mm -hmm. retail price. That could be anywhere from $200 to $500, but 300 is kind of a general middle ground. And they'll have a bushing system. And so what does that bushing system look like? Good barbells. Well, if you go to a gym and it has Rogue or York barbells, you're going to be okay. Rogue and York both make some basic barbells that aren't my favorite, but even their worst bars are going to be better than any of those that have the Allen screw in the end of the sleeve. Yeah. If the barbells have snap rings on the end of the sleeve or a pin, a roll pin driven into the, to hold the sleeve on, you're looking at a little bit better quality bar. You can look on the inside of the sleeve, the part of the sleeve that's closer to your hands. And you can typically see if there's a bronze bushing there. It'll be right, yep. you know, so the sleeve will be chrome and the bushing will be brass. It'll look like a little bronze ring, yep. like a wedding ring that goes around the barbell. That's like between the barbell and the sleeve itself. And that's the bushing. And that helps the bar spin and remain true. So a fine barbell, a good barbell is going to be probably raw steel. It might be a little rusty, which is just fine for us. It's going to be 28 and a half millimeters. It's not going to feel big and fat in your hand. Correct. The knurling is going to be grippy, but not bite you. Cheap bars have knurling that is, the bar looks checkered, but it really doesn't provide any grip, you know, improvements in the grip. Yep. And that good barbell is going to have sleeves that spin. It should have center knurl. So it, and it's going to be straight. Yeah, it's going to be straight. So you should be able to put it into the hooks that it sits in in the rack and you should be able to rotate it. And if the ends of the bar wobble down and up, yep. you can tell that the bar is bent, right? And so we want a nice straight bar. Yes, yeah, so you can just spin it. Yeah, you should be able to spin. The middle of that barbell, so the bar is going to be knurled, as Scott talked about, and that knurling will be in different spots on the bar. So what you'll see is there will be rings on the bar, which is just a guide to help tell you where to put your hands on certain lifts. A good barbell that we want to use for a multipurpose bar is going to have a center knurl. It's going to have some knurling in the very center of that bar, and that helps hold the bar on your back. And that center knurl is going to be what? It's about six inches wide, somewhere in that, nah, maybe not even quite that far, five inches wide. I'm sure there's an exact measurement. And outside of that center knurl is going to be some smooth portions to the bar. And that smooth portion is there for your legs on a deadlift so that you don't have to, when you drag the bar up your legs in a deadlift, you don't drag the knurl up your legs and eat into the flesh and give yourself <laughs> strawberries all the way up your legs, right? So that's why it's actually there. So that's big picture barbell. Mm -hmm. If we apply those big picture barbell sort of rules, do you have some favorite actual practical barbells that our listeners could go buy if they don't have a good barbell? The Rogue Ohio Bar with the center neural? The, the Ohio Power Bar. Yep. Yeah, so and I think there is an Ohio Bar that doesn't have center neural but the Ohio Power Bar does. It's 28 and a half millimeters. It's got good center neural. I like the bare steel bar. I think you do too, mm -hmm. right? That, that Ohio Power Bar comes also in like a black zinc. It looks cool. It's black. I've had several of those. The black wears off and I just don't like it as much. And then there's also a stainless steel. And so it's all chromed out. By the way, in general, another good rule of thumb on top of that hex nut end is if you go into one of those fitnessy gyms and the bar looks like it's chrome, yeah, it's junk. A chrome look to bar is typically junk unless it's a five hundred dollar bar made by Rogue. And even then, I'd rather have the bare steel. Yeah. How about you? Yeah, bare steel. The thing that makes it shiny also makes it kind of slick, and uh, nothing quite feels like the bare steel. Yep. Yeah, I like the Rogue Ohio Power Bar. Reps got a new one out, and they've got a, actually a stainless steel Power Bar. That's a great price for theirs. Cooper from Garage Gym Reviews reviewed that. And he thinks it's the best stainless steel power bar we just talked about. We like the bare steel a little bit better, but that stainless steel power bar, good price there. What's it called? I think it's just called the Rep Stainless Steel Power Bar. There you go. I think it's maybe their second version, like V2. And I think it runs like 379 or something. It's stainless steel. The Rogue Ohio Bar that's bare steel, I think it's 265 right now. And all of these big fitness companies, equipment manufacturers, so like Rogue and Rep and Titan, they all run these massive Black Friday sales, Thanksgiving sales. Rogue has a section on their website called the Boneyard. Yeah. And you can get really good barbells that have very tiny imperfections in the neural. And I'm talking about tiny imperfections yep. in the neural, not like something that looks goofy. If you bought a perfect bar and used it for two weeks, 
It would be a boneyard bar. It would look like a boneyard bar. That's exactly right. Mm -hmm. Man, they'll put those sometimes 50% off. You can buy like a really nice bar for 150 bucks. Um, a good barbell, a really good barbell will literally last forever. Yeah. So that that's the other thing about a good barbell. A crappy barbell is going to get replaced every year. But a good barbell is going to get passed down to your kids, and then your kids are going to pass it down to their kids if you take care of it. Yeah, Rogue will be running their Matt Black Friday, they call it, sales here pretty soon. The other bar I would recommend is the Texas Power Bar. You can buy the Bear Steel Texas Power Bar for two sixty nine at texaspowerbars.com. That's a great bar. They've been making them since 1980, yep. and you can't go wrong with that. And then you need plates. You know, if you're going to get a little home gym together, you know, any old weight will do. Some plates are more accurate than others, but you're going to need a dude. A dude's going to need about 500 pounds of, yep. you're going to need at least, this is a starter kit. And you, if you say, I'm not strong enough, I don't need this much, you're wrong because you'll need it quickly because you're now doing our program without yep. that jack around stuff you were doing. You're going to need four pairs of 45s minimum. So it's eight 45s. Yep. You're going to need a pair oh, of 25s. Two 25s, correct. Two pairs of 10s. Right, four 10-pound plates. One pair of fives, one pair of uh, 2.5s, and one pair of one and a quarter plates. And that's a total of 512 and a half pounds. Right. And then you'll need a barbell on top of that. So you'll be able to get up to 557. You will need more plates than that eventually. Sure. But that will get you started and that'll get you to your 500 pound deadlift. But if you got a training partner and you're squatting and they're pressing or you're squatting and they're bench pressing yep. or you're squatting and they're pulling or whatever, you'll need more plates. But that's a good kit to get a guy started. A lady could probably get by with one pair less of 45. Yeah, 300 pounds for a female is probably about right. 500 pounds for a guy will give you enough to get started somewhere in that ballpark. Women probably need more like 350 with the change plates. And certainly everybody is going to need at least the 1.25s. And that doesn't come in a typical sort of, you're not going to find 1.25s on Craigslist. You might be able to find all the other plates. And I would suggest that if you're just getting started, especially if money is tight, just get on Craigslist and get yourself some cheap what I did. iron plates, right? And sometimes you get lucky and you'll find the old York plates. If it says York on it, man, buy those things up. You got a good deal on those. Those micro plates, we love the fractional plates. And man, we love Mike at Micro Gains. He puts together a great set of fractional plates from, I believe, 1.25s all the way down to 0.25 pounds and he puts them in sets and they're super nice and you're going to get pretty quick especially on the overhead press where you can't add five pounds to the bar so with most weight plate sets they only go down to 2.5 pounds and we talked about this before there are lots of those fitness gyms that actually don't even have two and a half pound plates the smallest plates they have are fives which is crazy that's yeah, dumb it is very easy to buy a set of micro plates from micro gains of fractional plates and just keep them in your bag keep them in your gym bag and take them to the gym with you and then you've got quarter pound plates all the way up to 1.25s and you can make a combination to get that additional to be able to go up one pound two pounds three pounds yep two and a half pounds whatever you want and those are great plates so you can do that at micro gains also he gives the discount code right for barbell logic by the way like discount code logic if you go buy microplates from Mike, like we don't get any money out of that. It's just, we try to find, we'll talk about a few companies on this site that we just like them. We were using their product before They make great stuff and we developed a friendship with them and they're small business owners in the U S and so we like those guys. So yeah, you can use discount code logic, right? At microgains.com and that saves you yep. 10% off your order of fractional plates. Everybody needs fractional plates for sure. The gym near you may have those 12 sided. Oh. People call them hexagons. They're not. They're yeah. like dodecagon plates. Those are terrible. You need round plates. Cast iron's fine, although you'll drop one of them on your foot and hate them. You'll pinch yourself and get a blood blister. You'll hate them. And I think ultimately you're going to want a competition plate. A lot of people call them bumpers. I'm talking about something different than just a bumper. There are bumpers that are made out of like yeah. essentially tire rubber and a 45 pound plate could be like four and yeah, a quarter inches wide. thick. Yep. And you can't deadlift 500 with those because they fill the sleeves up on your barbell and you're going to be deadlifting 500. So I highly recommend getting a competition bumper that's got a big stainless steel, typically billet in the center of the plate that makes it a little denser and so they can make a 45 pound plate much thinner. My favorite of those right now is the French Sports Black Training Competition plates. They're just like your Rogue ones, Matt, but they're fringe. They're a little cheaper. They're inexpensive. The inside diameter of the hole in the plate will fit tightly and wonderfully about your barbell. Yeah. 
they're accurate. They're not as accurate as the Rogue plates. The Rogue plates are like plus or minus, I think, 15 grams or something like that. Yeah, they're close. You have the actual Rogue pound competition plates that are colored, yep. right? Like they're blue and red and stuff. And then I have the Rogue black train plates, and they're all black, except for they've got a, a ring around the outside that are blue and red. So there's sort of a standardization there as well, where 55-pound plates in all bumpers, they also make 55-pound which is a 25 kilogram, basically, is close. Yeah, don't buy that. And they'll be red. And then the 45 pound are blue. Yep. Right. And the 25 pound are green. Is that right? Yep. I think that's right. Mm -hmm. And that's the way it typically works for bumper plates. I love bumper plates. I have used iron plates my whole life and have converted over the last several years to bumper plates. Why I like them at home, they're quiet, they don't ruin your platform as fast. If you buy a nice set, they'll last forever. You're not going to smash your finger yep. with them. You're not going to give yourself blood blisters. You have a much less chance of dropping them on your toe. But again, for purposes of price and economy, if you're on a tight budget, the place to save money is in plates. And then if you want to be anal about it, just weigh those plates. Get yourself a nice scale, which is pretty cheap, and you can weigh the plates. And you can just mark on the plates what they weigh. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes those kind of pig iron plates... They could vary. A 45 pound plate could be anywhere from, I mean, they could vary three or four pounds, like, you know, 41, 42, up to 47, 48, which isn't that big of a deal as long as you've got two of them on each side that both weigh 47 or 48. But if you got a 41 on one side and a 48 on the other, or you're trying to press the thing. Yeah. So it really comes down to you want to use the same plates every single workout, every single time. So even if you don't know what your plates weigh, if the first set of 45s you put on the bar are always the same set, and the second set of 45s are always the same second set. You've got them, got them marked, you know, one, two, three, four. Then you at least know there's some consistency from workout to workout so that you know that, you know, the variation on the plates aren't going to screw up your LP. We've talked about the barbell and the plates a lot because that's really kind of maybe the most important thing. Get a good yeah. barbell. If you're going to spend money, go deluxe there. Yep. If you're going to save money or scrimp or whatever, be frugal, be frugal with the plates. Next, we've got to have a rack. Yep. You need a rack that you can have safeties on. I really want a rack yep. that you can hang safeties or a hook at above your head. Yep. Because eventually I may want you to do a uh, press lockouts or something where the barbell is going to have to be racked at a very high position. And so if I can choose, I want that. And I also want one that you can chin inside of as well. There are squat stands that are just fine. But if I'm picking, that's not what I pick, right? Right. There are these weird racks that the upright that you rack the barbell on is at like a, I don't know, like a 60 degree angle or something that you'll see at the gym. And they have fixed safeties. Those suck. Yeah. You have to march the bar out forever to get yep. to be able to squat to depth. Small people can't squat to depth inside of those. You can't do press lockouts inside of them. You can't bench in them. Right. So I want you to use, if I pick, I want you to use a real live power rack. Yeah, some people call it a cage. It's got a minimum of four verticals. It's got four big vertical bars on it. And it just looks like a big rectangular cube that you can lift inside of and it's there for safety. So it's got a bunch of holes going down the vertical sides and you attach what we call J cups or safety cups. That's such a stupid term. Yeah, because it kind of looks like a J, I guess. It's a hook. It's your hooks, you know. And it's where you put the barbell and then you've got your safety catches. You've got the bar that goes across that basically goes from the front vertical to the back verticals that are there to catch the bar in case you miss. Yep. So that you don't end up on the floor with the barbell. Just like Scott, I would prefer a tall rack, like a hundred inch tall rack somewhere in that ballpark so that you can actually press overhead inside the rack. Some of you won't have the ceiling space to do that and you'll have to press outside your rack, but then you can usually buy safeties that will actually attach the outside of your rack as well. Some of my favorites, the, oh, what's the standard, what's the Rogue one that's been around forever? The uh, R, the Rogue R3 is fantastic. Go look at that to figure out what you ought to have. Whether you buy it or not, go look at that. That one has the features and the finish and things that you should be looking for. Yeah. If you are entirely budget driven here, the Rep PR1100 Home Power Rack is $239 and is going to give you yeah. just darn near everything you would ever want. Yep. And then their top of the line, which I love, actually, I just sent one to Brett McKay. They just came out with last week is the Rep PR5000, their version two of the 5000. 
and it starts about 800 bucks and goes up to a thousand or so. Oh, dude, they start at 600. Oh, they start at 600. Yeah. And go on up. But the cool thing about all of these, about Rep and Rogue and all these companies is that the racks at this point now are so customizable, right? You can get all kinds of different heights. You can get all kinds of different depths. You can get all kinds of different colors. One of the things I love about that PR5000 rack from Rep is that it has numbered. So it's two inch hole spacing, which I like. Sometimes you'll see the old channel iron racks and they have three or four inch hole spacing. It's too far. The hole spacing is too far. So you need two inch hole spacing and they're numbered on those new 5000s. They're awesome. So you can say, oh, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to bench press at number 11 and you can just put them on number 11 on both sides. Make sure it's all lined up correctly. Love those racks for sure. So you got to have a good rack. But there are definitely some of those budget racks that work really, really well. The Rogue R3 for me will always be the gold standard. Their heavier, bigger racks are worse, I think. I like the R3 with the 2x3 11 gauge, I think. 11 gauge steel uprights is great. They have a 3x3 and they even have a bigger one. And that means that the accessories all weigh more. So the spotter arms weigh more. The hooks weigh more. Everything weighs more. And they don't need to. We squat heavy, 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 heavy weights in our R3 racks with a 2x3 and 11 gauge upright and have no problem whatsoever. And then it has the west side hole spacing, which is great. No, it'll hold all the weight that you ever want. And mine's the 3x3. So it's got one inch hole spacing for the bench press. And Rogue has that easy way to know. So that R3 means it's basically, if I remember right, the R3 means it's three feet deep. The R4 is four feet deep. The R6 is six feet deep. And that R6 has six vertical uprights. And so the advantage of something like an R4 over an R3 is that when you go from the R3 to the R4, it's much easier to have two people lifting in the rack at the exact same time. So if you're going to lift, I went with the R6, which is really just an R4 with additional uprights for the weight storage in front of it. And the reason I did that is because my wife is 5'5", five five and I'm 6'1", mm-hmm. and I wanted to have basically two racks for one. And so if you get a deep enough rack, then my wife can squat inside the rack. I can squat outside the rack at the exact same time. She can have safeties inside the rack. I can have the outside safeties outside the rack if I need them. And you effectively get two racks. Now, you can do the same thing with the R3, if you put it in the middle of the platform and each person and they face each other, right? So you can lift on the outside of the R3, but then you're not really lifting inside the rack. So that's the only reason I don't like that quite as much, but certainly I'd buy the biggest rack you can afford, but the three by three steel, just the tubing, it's like the steel tubing, the size of that tubing matters less than the size of the rack, right? So that two by three versus three by three, the two by three is perfectly good. So Love Rogue, love Rep. Titan does a pretty good job too. Good squat rack, good barbell, good weights. Yep, two by three is the way. Benches, you gotta have a bench. The bench is the Rep 5000. I know we both agree on them. The bench. It's the bench. It's the bench. It's the best bench on the market. It's 149 bucks. The FB 5000 competition flat bench. Don't get it with the Thompson fat pad, wide pad. Get it with the regular pad. The regular pad is wider than normal. And it's covered in like a, it's covered in some sort of voodoo magic. It's covered in like this combination of vinyl and rubber. It's not exactly rubber, but it's not exactly vinyl. It's like uh, if rubber and vinyl had a baby and then they wrap this bench in that. It's like some awesome sort of um, marine upholstery that you would put on a boat or something. I don't know. Yeah. But the surface is very good. Yeah, but it's more rubbery even than that marine. Yeah. Yeah. It's real sticky. You don't scoot down the bench. And why do we love it? My favorite thing about it is it's got a center post down by your feet. Whereas a lot of benches have the horizontal pieces that come out of both sides. And then when you try to set up your bench, the legs of the bench press get in the way of your feet. Yep. And the thing I love about that FB5000 is that it's got the horizontal piece up by your head, which is not a big deal. So it gives the bench stability, but has a single center post underneath your butt. And it's got a nice kind of round handle that you can pick it up and you can roll it in and out of the way and love it. By the way, Rogue has copied them at this point, but Rogue's bench is significantly more expensive. And that FB5000 is from Rep is a fantastic bench. As a matter of fact, I think you and I both got that FB5000 over a year or so now, and we both immediately got rid of our Rogue Monster bench. Yep, yep. It's way better. The center post, the wheels. 
it has wheels on it and a little handle and you can pick it up and move it around like a two wheel dolly. It's just the best. And at $149, you can't even, I mean, do better. That's ridiculous. When it comes to you, it's easier to put together than the rogue bench. I mean, yeah. On and on and on. It beats it in every category. They've improved it since we bought ours, Matt. They now come with these nice rubber feet. I know. Mine don't have the rubber feet on it. I just emailed them and said, hey, can I buy some rubber feet for my two benches? It's the best bench out there. There's no question. So if you've got a good rack like we've recommended here, you've got yourself, you know, about 500 pounds of mass you can hang on your good barbell that you've bought and you've got this FB5000 bench, you've got just darn near everything you need. You may want a platform. You may not. You can start with just, if you've got bumper plates, well, I, th I think you should. You can start with bumper plates and not have a platform. And if you just got a good concrete surface or something, yeah, you can then upgrade if you want to some horse stall mats you buy at the Atwoods or the Tractor Supply or the Orchelin store or whatever it is, the farm supply store near you. Or you can actually go build a platform and there are some instructions. You can go to Art of Mailing, this website, and uh, look up the platform building work that Matt and McKay did in McKay's garage. And then... You know, you've got to have your Dominion belt. If you've never used a belt before, you need to buy a three-inch single-prong belt from Dominion, Dominion Strength. You can get them wherever you want, but don't buy the one at the sporting goods store because I guarantee you they suck. I've never seen a good belt in a retail store. You're going to have to buy it off the web, no. and our favorite people are the ones at Dominion Strength. Those are the belts that we use. The price is right. The quality is outstanding. They deliver them to you right away no waiting so you know obviously blake at, at dominion strength you can buy a belt all the way up to like they ship within the week and you get it pretty fast and even though they're going to obviously have to ramp up production tremendously this time of year it might slow down shipping a little bit listen if you order from dominion within the first couple weeks of december you're going to have it in time for christmas which is fantastic and so yeah they've got a discount code too i think it's logic also right logic yep. i hope it's logic mm -hmm. I believe it is. So logic, and that will give you a discount off of any belt at Dominion Strength as well. So we like them. A couple of the peripherals, you're going to need a block of chalk, right? You're going to need chalk, which is cheap. Shoes. And shoes. So chalk you can order from Amazon. You can order it. It's just a block of magnesium. Magnesium carbonate, I think. I think it's magnesium carbonate. Too. We bought a box of Ader, A-D-E-R, chalk. Uh-huh. Yeah. You know, it's a box of like six blocks or eight blocks or 10. I don't even know how much. It is garbage. Yeah. You pick it up and it just shatters in your hand. It's just, so don't buy that. It sucks. It just powders up instantly. I want my chalk to hold together and I want to uh, paint my hand with it like it was a, you know, like it was sidewalk chalk or something when you were a kid. Sure. Just go buy the chalk at Rogue. The Rogue Fitness chalk is I mean, I don't know, $7 for four blocks or something. It'll last you forever. And it's good. It holds together and it doesn't have any gritty pieces in it. You know, it's what you want. Yeah. It's what you want. Side note, if you train in a public gym that doesn't allow chalk, first off, that's a pretty good idea of why you should be in a different gym, but I get it. Some of you can't. There's actually liquid chalk you can buy at Rogue or Elite FTS or something. So it's liquid grip or liquid chalk. And really what it is, is it's basically like Germex with chalk in it. It's not great, but it works really well on travel. And if your gym doesn't allow chalk, then you basically squirt this into your hand and you rub it in your hand. And it's got that same chalk in it. And you let the alcohol evaporate off your hands and it leaves a very, very thin coating of chalk in your hand. And it won't really leave any on the bar. And so it won't make a mess, but it'll still certainly help you with the grip. And you'll want that certainly on the deadlift and probably on all the lifts, right? So bench press and press as well, for sure. I still even chalk up on the squat. I just like it. I like the feel of my hands being chalked up and holding on that bare steel bar. I'll chalk my back. Yeah, chalk your back. Except I've stopped chalking my back because I've converted over to the A7 shirts. Well, before we get to the shirt, we got to get shoes first. Yeah, you're right. Shoes are more important. The chalk is not a luxury. And shoes are not a luxury. As a matter of fact, if you had to buy shoes or a belt, I would buy shoes before I bought a belt. Absolutely. Would you agree? Absolutely. So shoes first, belt second. Mm, you got to have chalk. Chalk's so cheap. You got to buy chalk when you buy the equipment, right? So you got to have chalk. So what's the rule for shoes? There are all kinds of good shoes out here now, and that was not the case just a few years ago. If you have a brand that you like, like if you're a Reebok person and you know that you're a nine and a half in Reeboks or whatever, go buy the Reebok Legacy Lifter. Yep. 
perfectly fine. You want a shoe with a non-compressible sole, you want it with an elevated heel, and you want it with at least one strap. And it needs to not be a multi-purpose shoe because we are not doing multi-purpose stuff. We're training for strength. So you don't want an Innovate, you don't want a CrossFit trainer, you want a real live Olympic weightlifting shoe or squat shoe. If you're a Reebok person, go buy the Reebok Legacy Lifter. If you're a Nike person, go buy the Nike Romaleo, Yep, I think is what they call it. Both of those shoes are fairly expensive, but you already know what size you are. You like those brands. You could go do that. If you don't know what you like and you have a narrow foot, Adidas Powerlift 4 is the starter shoe. That is the starter shoe. The Powerlift 4, don't buy the Powerlift 3, 2, buy the Powerlift 4. That's their newer one. They all have uh, man-made uppers, but the Powerlift 4 the upper is like Cordura and it's not some weird vinyl stuff. So it breathes, it won't crack. That's a much better shoe than their previous shoes. Uh, you can probably pick those up on some website for maybe something like 69 to $99, depending yep. on what color you want or what size your foot is. If you're a wide footed person, you won't be able to wear those because they're well suited for our narrow footed friends. So if you have a wide foot, what is the brand that we suggest? Well, I love. The Rogue Classic Do Win. Yeah, me too. That'd be my favorite for a wide foot. That's the shoe I wear. That's the shoe Charity wears. Shoes like that have been made now for about probably 50 or 60 years. It has a stack leather sole, so it's easy for a, a cobbler to put a shim on there if you need that or something like if you need. It has two straps. The upper is suede. It's a durable shoe. You're going to wear the insides of those shoes out before they even show wear on the outside. It's a great shoe. It's probably 125 bucks, but that shoe will still be going long after your Adidas Powerlift 4s are gone. Here's the bad stuff about that shoe. It's 125 bucks, but it's going to last a long time. And your Nike and your Reebok is probably about the same price as well. Or more. Or maybe more. Yep. So it's a little costly, but it's durable. So that's okay. They're heavy. That's a downside to those, but we're not running, so I don't care. Don't do chins in them. <laughs> don't do your chin-ups in those shoes. Yeah, I kick them off for my chins. They can also be hot. You know, they can also be hot. They don't breathe that much, although it's not horrible. So you may, uh, you know, if you get mad when your feet are hot, you may not like that. But I think they're great, and even though they have a few negatives, I just wanted to say what those were, even though they have a few negatives. That's no question my shoe and will be for a long time. They quit making them for a while and it made me very sad. And the day I saw they were there, I bought three pairs. <laughs> nice. Yeah, the general rule is, to sum all this up, is that Adidas, Nike, Rogue, Dewin, and Reebok really don't make a bad weightlifting shoe. As long as you don't, Reebok has one or two out there that are like a combo CrossFit weightlifting shoe. Don't get that. Mm -hmm. But if you get a shoe that's called a lifter shoe, a weightlifting shoe, a powerlifting shoe from one of those companies, it's got that raised heel, it's got the flat sole, you really can't go wrong there. Any of those would be perfectly acceptable. And they are so much better than wearing a tennis shoe, right? Especially a squishy tennis shoe, mm -hmm. a Nike Air with like an air bubble underneath it. It's just ridiculous. I mean, right? So we're trying to be stable and solid against the floor because what strength training is, is force production. We've got a barbell on our back. We're trying to actually push force into the floor to raise the barbell. And so to have a squishy shoe, the very reason a shoe is squishy for running, right, is it's like its own little kind of suspension system for your feet is exactly why we don't want it for squatting and deadlifting and pressing and bench pressing. And you should actually probably wear these shoes on all four of those lifts. That'd be a great place to start. There are reasons down the line to maybe change and wear a different shoe on a deadlift or a bench press. But in the beginning for the first six months year, and maybe forever, you can wear that pair of shoes for all four of those big lifts. Certainly. Yep. The virtues of the shoe are the sole is non-compressible, so it's not squishy. Like Matt said, when you have your body weight plus several hundred pounds on your back and the shoe squishes underneath you, it makes it hard to control your center of gravity. The thing has an elevated heel, and because it has the elevated heel, when you squat down in the hole, it makes your knee go out to the right spot and lets us use the right muscles as you come up off the ground. So you want that elevated heel. That's right. And because it has the elevated heel and your squat's really, really heavy on your back, if you didn't do something, your foot would slide down that inclined plane that the shoe makes and just bunch up down in the toe box. That's right. So you have to strap your foot to the sole of the shoe to keep your foot from sliding down. 
they'll have straps. And I like to wear two straps, although a properly placed single strap shoe is mighty fine. It'll keep your foot from sliding down into the toe box and bunching up down there in the bottom. And it also will compress and all the bones on the arch of your foot across the arch of the shoe and uh, give you some support. So that's what you want there. You wear them pretty tight, right? So it's a similar, so if you ever played any other sports you played, I mean, you know, you think about if you've ever worn like football cleats or baseball cleats or something, you, you don't want them flopping around on your foot. And it's the same thing here with this. This is a sports shoe. And so we tie it tight. We put that strap on tight. I actually don't, since I have the double strap, I don't tie them too tight. I can snug just like I would a regular shoe. Yeah. And I strap them down. Yeah. So I will pull the laces tight across the top of my foot relatively tight, but then I don't tie that knot tight because I don't want it really tied around my ankle. I want it just tied across the top of my foot. And then for me, I only have one strap. I have the old Adidas Power Perfect 2s, which I love, but they're hard to get your hands on now, but they're a single strap shoe. And so I'll make the uh, laces. But if you got some Lee Stungs, the Lie Stungs that have the dial mm -hmm. that cranks in, like click, 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 knob. the knob, and it cranks it tight. You know, So they got all kinds of like gimmicky stuff out there that works just fine. Just don't show up wearing your Nike shocks to try to squat it. And shocks would be, see, that's a shock system. That would be ridiculous. So, so those are the basics, right? Barbell, weights, rack, bench, platform. That's the equipment that you need. Chalk to lift with. And then your actual personal equipment, you absolutely need shoes, and belt. And then my first couple pieces of luxury equipment I'm going to get is probably going to be an A7 shirt, wrist wraps, and knee sleeves. Yeah, wrist wraps would be the first one I would get. Wrist wraps, which aren't straps. No. We would call those, you know, lifting straps. We used to pick up Correct. deadlifts and weird things. They're wraps. The wraps go around your wrist and um, they're typically pieces of elastic and they compress all the bones there in your wrist and provide you with a proprioceptive cue. They let you know when your wrists are bent. They're not so supportive that they won't let you bend your wrist, but they make you keenly aware of where your wrists are and what angle your wrist is bent at. And they do provide some support. Just go ahead and order them. I mean, they're not very much. No. Go get a 24-inch one. Go buy 24-inch wrist straps. You can get them from yeah. Rogue. Shorter than that is too short. Yeah. Don't buy their base ones. Buy at least the white series, which are going to be the more slightly stiffer versions. And they do have even stiffer ones than that. But for beginners, that white series is probably what you want. It's nice and tight. You don't need to buy anything. I saw they have that weird leather one now. Don't buy the leather one. Yeah. Don't buy the thing that's called the Rogue wraps that are like just this like, what would you call it? It's almost like a cottony material or a like a yeah you don't want that you want the normal wrist wraps white series they're 24 inches that's what you want or lead fts has a ton of good ones as well so there's lots of good options there but a good stiff 24 inch wrist strap works great love those knee sleeves you like knee sleeves i like knee sleeves especially for our older population that has creaky knees i have always worn the ray-ban r-e-h-b-a-n-d seven millimeter blue knee sleeves i believe all the seven millimeters are blue and then they've got the special colors for the five millimeter but that means they're too thin so i like the seven millimeter and then the other very popular knee sleeve is the sbd i've never worn those those look like very intense knee sleeves to me yeah they're a little much um my father and several of my clients now have the a7 thick knee sleeves oh yeah I like those and uh, i put them right in there with the ray-ban ones they're contoured right. They don't roll down. They stay where they're supposed to. I mean, it has all the virtues of the Ray-Ban, Ray-Ban sleeves. So the A7 ones are good. You don't have to have those. Although if you train outside or out in the garage and it's cold, you may need them. Yeah. But they're nice to have. That's a nice to have thing. The wrist wraps really aren't a nice to have. You need those at some point. When your press starts getting heavy and your bench press gets heavy, you're going to want those. And then the other thing that you mentioned there is we really like the A7 squat shirt, bar grip shirt, they call it got a rubberized back to it i don't know somehow they've magically attached little rubber swirls basically on the back of your t-shirt it's just a cotton t-shirt with nice rubbery sticky back and it helps keep the bar in place on your back so you know that's a luxury but it's amazing how often i notice people wearing things that i would say are inappropriate for their lifting not inappropriate because they're scandalous or anything but like i had a new client today guy's probably 48 years old he had basketball shorts on that were three inches below his knees. 47 years old. Like, business guy. Sorry, if you listen, I love you. You're going to be an awesome client. I'm just like, bro, you got to learn the value of the shorty shorts. We're 47. We don't care, right? We wear Speedos when we swim. 
We wear shorty shorts for shorts. You don't need to wear those big basketball shorts. So think about what you're wearing. And at the same time, I see people all the time that are wearing like Nike dry fit or Under Armour dry fit type t-shirts to squat, like those slick 100% like, what are those? Polyester nylon combo shirts. Yeah. You know what I'm talking about? They're those slick shirts are slick and they're squatting with them. So at the very least, you need a good cotton, 100% cotton shirt and one step up from that. I say one step up from that. It's like another universe when you put it on are those A7 bar grip shirts. I love those for squat and I love them for bench press. Boy, I tell you what, you, you put an A7 shirt on with that 5,000 bench from rep, you, ain't you are not moving. I love it. So I got to go back and talk about this man's basketball shorts. The yeah. reason those are inappropriate is because they go below the knee. Yeah. And there's a hem right below the knee. And that hem makes the fabric less stretchy. And it kind of catches on your knee That's right. as you're squatting. And it's distracting. And it, it'll make it pull the waistband down because it catches on your knee. It's just super annoying. So you want a pair of shorts that either don't go below the knee under any circumstance or just wear, you know, some pants. I got my man pants, squat pants on here. My, yeah. my man yoga pants today. I'll be squatting in. The A7 shirt also is a little thicker than a regular shirt. And for my older people that have, you know, as we get older, our skin gets thinner. Having that extra thickness between us and the barbell can really protect our skin. We can get little skin tears and abrasions and things older yep. people do when they squat heavy. So yeah, the A7 shirt is good. And man, the price is right. It's $34.95. I think it's cheap. It's more expensive than just a shirt from Sam's or Academy or wherever you buy shirts to squat in, but they last a long, long time and they're a big value for what they are. Yeah. The pair of, gosh, the first one I bought, I just got lucky and found my first A7 shirt at, at Rogue. And see, I bet I've had my A7 shirt, gosh, for at least five, six, seven years at this point. Yeah. Now I've got some new ones that I've got from them. We like them. We've developed a friendship with those guys. And so I've got some new ones now, but that one that I've used for years and it's still sticky. Mm -hmm. It's still a sticky back. Like that rubber works. You know, I wash it inside out when I wash it. So the rubber is on the inside. I don't think you have to, you know, it's a super well-made shirt. It's never, the seams haven't unraveled at all. Like it's held up great. So that's it. So some of those are luxuries. Those A7 shirts are luxury. The wrist straps are luxuries. The knee sleeves are luxuries. Unless you've got some pretty bad knee issues, knees real creaky or painful. There's something about just compressing a joint if you have some joint pain that just sort of makes it feel better. I don't know that it actually fixes anything, but uh, it's one of the reasons we wear knee sleeves, just keeps your knees nice and warm more than anything else. And that's a pretty good place to start. If you buy the sort of better quality of all the things we've mentioned here, you buy the bigger rep rack. You go ahead and you spend 300 bucks on a bar. You pay about a buck 50 a pound for your plates. Those are good plates. Cause you might be able to get them for 50 cents a pound on Craigslist. You're going to be at about $1,800 here, right? Yeah. You've got a gym. And what's your time worth, right? So you got to remember, you can't compare it to the 30 bucks a month or God forbid, the $10 a month. If you're going to a $10 a month place, you should quit immediately. You can't compare it to that because and you, certainly that's part of the equation. But Scott mentioned it before. It's the value of time. How long does it take to drive to that gym three or four times a week, drive home three or four times a week? Deal with all the bullshit that's at the gym. Wait on a squat rack. That's right. So what is your time worth? And certainly for our listeners, that's all over the board, right? So for some of you, your time is worth 10 or 15 bucks an hour. And for some people, that's $500 an hour. But even if it's 10 or $15 an hour, it doesn't take very long for your time to pay for $1,800 gym. And $1,800 gym is a really nice gym. And so you can certainly do it well for even less than that. You know, and then it's part of your culture of your home. It's something that you do. You know, we don't have, Scott and I don't, and most of our listeners don't have man caves where we hang up jerseys on the wall and we don't have, you know, pool tables and ping pong tables and poker tables and yeah. big screen TVs and, and places where we watch football games. Like we have libraries and whiskey collections and gyms. We used to have studies. We do have studies, you and I. Yep. And so, you know, if you got a man cave, throw all that shit out, quit worshiping these other athletes, become an athlete on your own of both the mind and the body. Put a gym in there or a bunch of shelves and put some books in that room. How about both? That'd be cool. Have you seen any of those? As a matter of fact, if you have, I would love to see if you have pictures of a gym slash study, you've got a squat rack platform and books on the wall. That'd be cool to see. I'd like to see those pictures. Send those to us. 
Well, there's another Barbell Logic podcast. I hope this is helping you get started. We went a little longer on this one than I thought we would, but the essentials are a good bar. A good bar. Any rack that keeps the stuff from falling on you. Yep. Plates that weigh something. You need good shoes that are purpose-built for our sport, and you need a good belt and a bench. Yep. And after that, everything else is gravy and just makes our sport a little more pleasant and uh, makes your work a little bit easier. Do that stuff. Now, if you buy that stuff and then 12 months later you decide you hate this and you won't, you'll be able to sell that stuff on Facebook Marketplace or Craigslist within hours for about 90% of what you paid for it. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. 85%. It holds its value really well. This ain't a computer or a uh, Kia or something that's not durable and depreciates <laughs> instantly. This stuff lasts and uh, you'll get your money back. Yeah. If you want some help with the lifts, if you want somebody to have a look at how you move, if you want somebody to have a look at your programming, you need help with doing the program, you can please. Yeah, just help getting started. Yeah. Just if you need some help getting started. Email experience at barbell-logic.com and we will come to your aid for free. That's right, for free. We'll give you a little Skype consult with one of our good coaches. No, wait a minute. All of our coaches are good. One of the coaches that uh, work at Barbell Logic does the Skype calls. Yep. <laughs> um, we'll give you a, a Skype call so you get a little consultation, get a little Q&A time there, enroll you in our uh, software and give you some programming and give you some video feedback on your list. And you'll be a client We'll give you a little taste of what it's like. And yeah, no strings attached. Yeah, we'll get you moving. Totally free. Yeah, get you started. Thank you so much for listening. Send this to your buddy. Send this to your spouse if they've been dragging their feet on letting you uh, buy some equipment. And start saving that money up. You can get 1800 bucks. Uh, go mow some extra yards or something. Pile that 1800 bucks up and uh, go get some of this equipment and take care of your bodies. Thank you guys for listening, and we'll talk to you in a few days. Boom. Boom. Boom.